Hi folks, this is uh, Richard Hall here from uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa, uh, and this is the night sky. And of course, I always have Kay with me to keep me in place. And of course, that other guy over there, <laughs> uh, Keith Austin. Yeah, right? Keith Austin. Hey. And we always like to thank Dan Broughton, who uh, from Wirewrapper Web Design, who sponsors this particular program. And of course. One of the reasons why we, I'm here running a program about the night sky is that uh, we have something so special here in the night in, in the Wairapa, uh, which most people take for granted. That eighty percent of the people of the world have never seen the Milky Way because of bright lights and so on. And we, so we've got a beautiful spot where we can see things here at the moment. But anyway, I should first of all wanted to talk to you about UFOs. Here's a big UFO that we photo <laughs> actually photographed by Ian Cooper. Uh, uh, at our place here and it was just so beautiful you had this cloud all on its own there catching the light of the sun that had set and so on yeah maybe we should have a program talking about ufos and aliens at a later date yes? well it does look like an alien mothership it's um, actually looks to me like a lenticular what it is a it? lenticular, lenticular cloud <laughs> but they look so much like uh, huge alien motherships you expect well, to see the, ca the camera doesn't capture it all there because it was a brilliant glowing red color and there was no other clouds around so it's mm. really stood out you know yeah anyway folks let's get back into our, our night sky starting off by looking at the south the stars for those of you watching this on tv are at about 10 o'clock in the evening okay uh, tonight and so on and you'll find that the southern cross looking to the south is virtually its lowest point in the sky so there it is there and just above of course we've got these wonderful magellanic clouds they look like detached portions of the milky way mm. and and they, they do look a little bit like a cloud but you can see them quite easily with the unaided eye and they are two satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. The brighter one is called the Large Magellanic Cloud. Surprise, surprise. And it is a fantastic object because with telescopes and that, even amateur telescopes, you can explore these objects. And at the bottom left hand corner, you can see there uh, an ob object we call the Tarantula Nebula. Uh, we'll have a look at this in more detail at a later program. But it's the, perhaps the biggest star forming region that we can see at the moment in our galaxy but i've got to say something straight away um we can only see about 10 percent of our galaxy because we're part of it it's, yes. in other words you can't see you can't see the forest for all the trees and that around us and so on yes right? so that's a large cloud there and of course on the other side there we have the small magellanic cloud uh it's always got that sort of tadpole shape that you see and it's a more distant of the two being 204 thousand light years away now that might seem a hell of a long way and it is but as far as galaxies are concerned it's actually quite close yes um, they are true satellites of the milky way galaxy yeah and, yes. and and indeed the shapes of them the distorted shapes are due to the tidal effect of the milky way from the gravity and, yes and with the passage of time they will be assimilated yeah and that's something we do know actually is that large galaxies like the milky way galaxy um come into being because they simply uh, assimilate other galaxies around other thing i should always point out in the, in the small magellanic clouds you can see that what appears to the eye is a fuzzy star that cause no fuzzy star it's an absolutely fabulous star this is 47 to carne um and it's much closer it's uh, what we call a globular star cluster and globular star clusters are made up of ancient stars right going back m billions and billions of years in time long before the sun was formed right to the birth of our own galaxy yeah and yes. they are actually yes. the globular clusters left on the outer regions of the galaxy are simply the relics that have been left over from the formation of mm. our galaxy now the thing with 47 to Kearney, um I I've seen it quite a few times through my through my own telescopes, and the thing that amazes me is that it has like a three-dimensional effect through the through through the telescope. It looks like it's actually you can actually see the spherical nature of it. It's an it's an amazing object and incredibly beautiful if you do manage to capture it through a telescope. Well, um, there's, yeah. it's sunny. There's another big bright one called Omega Centauri, and it's something special in the southern hemisphere because the globular clusters that can be seen, none of them are anywhere near as bright as 47 Tucani and yes. Omega, and yeah. they can only be seen from the southern hemisphere. Yeah, 
And I can remember when I first came over to New Zealand and looking at this thing and absolutely stunned at what I could see in the yes. telescope. Yeah. Yes, absolutely fabulous. Well, turning around to the north, of course, uh, directly north we have, of course, the the Great Square. We're looking away from the, the Milky Way now, so it, we don't see all those bright patches of stars and so on. But the, the Great Square is dead easy to pick out. It's made up of four relatively bright stars, but because there's no other bright stars around, they certainly stand out. Okay, so That's the Great Square looking out there. And rising up in the east, of course, we have Matariki. The Pleiades star cluster. Yes. Right? And essentially what you're looking at now are the stars that would be seen at dawn at the time uh, in June of the of the rising, the first rising of those stars. Right? So these are the stars that we would see if you were getting up real early. Well, the advantage is that it's getting darker and darker and the stars are becoming more and more visible and it's a lot warmer. Yes, that's, that's right. That's why we have the teaching Matariki event in the 3rd of November. That's right, yeah. We always do each year, we take people, because we can take people out, because when we talk about the Māori New Year, it's not just the, the Pleiades or Matariki rising. There is a whole host of other things in the sky mm. that can only be seen at that time. It's basically the sky is reset to creation that's each right, year. Yeah, mm. that's right. So uh, we will have a, be having a special program about that coming up in November. Anyway, we'll be, we'll be talking about that at a later date. Okay. So the plea of these star cluster, right? And they are uh, the material, the gas around them. There's about eighty odd stars there, and you've got a small cluster of bright stars there, all much brighter than the sun and used to think that was a debris left over from these stars uh, when they were formed, but it's not. They're actually just colliding with a, another gas cloud. Yeah. Yes, there just happens to be a huge cloud of gas that they're ploughing through at the moment, mm. and that's where that nebulosity, that cl blue cloudy effect, uh, yeah. comes from. Well, mm. just as, of course, just to recap some of the things we're looking at, the brightest star-like object just above Matariki and, and to the left looking at it, of course, it's the planet Jupiter that we can see in the sky, which is absolutely fabulous object, but we're gradually moving further and further away from Jupiter, so Jupiter in the sky. And the other planet is above the Great Square to the left, and that is, of course, the planet Saturn, right? which is, again, and one of those stunning things when you look at it in the telescope. Right? Yes. But, uh, but anyway, we, we've had a little chat about those before, and of course they're, they're gradually moving away from us at the moment. So there's the two planets in the sky that we can see at the moment, right? And of course, there being planets, that brings in the zodiac. Uh, and why the, uh, you see, the zodiac, the constellations of the zodiac, lay along the plane of the solar system. Now, our solar yes. system is a big flattened system. So the sun, the moon, and the planets, as viewed from the Earth, all pass through the same constellations, the 12 constellations of the zodiac. And for those of you watching this on TV, you will see that Saturn is in Aquarius and Jupiter is in Aries. Okay. And also remember what we were looking at last time, some of the other bright things there, the great square is filled mostly by the constellation of Pegasus of the horse and well, the elbow of Andromeda as she's sitting there. <laughs> and of course last time we looked at all the grand legends of Andromeda which is tied up with Pegasus and of course Cetus the sea monster which is above. Now that might look, for you who's watching on TV, might all look a bit complicated with all those constellations there, but the Chinese have managed to um, smooth it out a little bit because that forms a single great constellation called the White Tiger of Autumn, mm. of Chinese. <coughs> However, I should point out to you, we'd have to call it the White Tiger of Spring down here in the South Yes, Memphis. because we're, we're the other <laughs> way around, yes. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Anyway, that's the Great Tiger, as Andromeda there, right? And of course, there's the great galaxy in Andromeda. I'd love to pick it out this more than once because while in the northern hemisphere, it's in the sky for a long period of time and overhead. Here in New Zealand, it's in the northern regions and we can just pick it out. And it is a giant galaxy about twice the size of our Milky Way galaxy. Its distance is two and a half million light years. Right? 
and it's got a diameter as it says there for they haven't got it 220,000 light years in diameter and contains a trillion stars right it's considerably bigger than our Milky Way yeah. galaxy. And yes. uh, is it, it is the nucleus. It is the biggest galaxy in the local group. How? But don't put our galaxy down. It's the second brightest out of about 80 galaxies in the local group. And just coming up at the moment, hopefully you can bring it in. Whoosh. Here's a lovely photograph of that region taken uh, by the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's quite a magnificent object. So that's the M31, the great galaxy in Andromeda, which you can see at the moment. Anyway, having said that, we're going to have a look at the stars, but I thought before we go any further, we should get Keith to play us a little bit of music. <laughs> yeah, well, I've brought my keyboard with me, um, so I'll play. Um, just, just noticing the weather out there, it's um, uh, absolutely blowing and raining and that sort of thing, so I thought I'd play a suitable song for it. Let's move on to another microphone. And look, whiz back into your chair because the camera's been trying to set. And where, there he is now. Yeah, here he is. <laughs> he could, oh, that's what I look like. <laughs> <laughs> it, he couldn't see, good. All he could see was your elbow most of the time from there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I should have kept the camera. Right. Okay, folks, we're back with the night sky. And um, I thought what we'd do next after looking at that is look at some of the interesting bright stars in the sky. And what's come up just above Saturn is a brightest star, dead easy to pick, and that is the star Fommelhort. Now, Fommelhort is actually um, one of our neighbours, all right? And there's actually a photograph of it. It's just 25 light years away, which is pretty close as far as most stars go. And it's almost 17 times brighter than the sun, all right? And the uh, interesting thing is, though, its its mass is about almost double, but what we've discovered is not a single star, it's actually a multiple star. And it's, there's two companion stars. They're not even close to it. They're about almost a light year away from Fommelhort and in the sky some distance away. But what we've found is that by looking at the motions of the stars and their composition, they appear to be part of the same system. So it appears that it is either is still a triple star system or was once a triple star system. 
a from mm. a hawk there. Okay, and it's a white hot star. The other, th it's white hot star. I said seventeen times lighter. You, the other stars are not easy to see with the unaided eye. Uh, in fact, neither of them can be seen with the unaided eye. You need a telescope. Uh, one is about uh, just twenty percent the brightness of the sun. All right. And it's a, a K-type star, and the other is a red dwarf, and it's 2,500 times fainter than the sun. Now, this is not unusual, I have to point out to you that the vast majority of stars in the galaxy, the vast majority are in fact red dwarfs, right? The brighter a star is, the less common it is. So when, but we look up in our night sky and we pick up big, brilliant stars like Rigel and so on, but they're unusual, all right? Most stars are nowhere near as bright as that. We just see them because they shine out over the light years, okay? Yes. So all the, all the stars that we see naked eye, yeah. without, without telescope or whatever, those are the really big, bright powerful absolutely stars. Oh, they're very very close and with a few few they're, exceptions and they're they're the less common yeah that's stars. Right, yeah yes now the interesting thing about fomalhaut is actually when we look at the chemistry and so on it's got an age of 490 million years now you might think that's pretty old if you were 490 <laughs> but for stars this is an absolute baby okay mm, stars uh, are often Billions of years old. Yeah, yeah, it's about a tenth the age of the of the sun, right? Mm. A tenth the age of the sun. So this means it is a really young star system, right? Baby star. And the interesting thing is that looking at this baby star with things like the Hubble Space Telescope, it's surrounded by a disk of matter. And in the disk, uh, Hubble thought they could see what would be a forming planet forming planets all right however later observations have shown that it's not actually a planet it's a, a globular within there uh, but they believe that planets are still in the process of actually forming in the photograph you can see there uh, for those watching on tv you can see this big disk of matter around that central star which is the, the forming stuff of a, a solar system so in the millions of years to come yes planets will be forming around from a halt, right? So it's in, the, it's in the process or the position our own sun was billions of years ago when it was a baby sun, right? So we're looking at an analogue of what our solar system looked like when it was being formed. Absolutely, and of course yes. that's what we can do. We, we, ca we can't look into the past, but what we can do is by looking at other stars and working out what their ages are, we can see how stars evolve over time. We can't look into our past, but no. when we look into the sky, we look no. into the past. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm. Not unless you could leap a long way away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, from what was that? Down, if, following down the line through Saturn, we come to Altair, is in the west there. It's dead easy to pick out. It's a pretty bright star. But it, too, is a, a nearby star, but it's also very young as well. So we have got some babies. There's a photograph of Altair. Its distance is just over 17 light years. It's uh, ten and a half times brighter than the sun, right? Oh. And that's Altair there. And uh, again, we know it's got a very, very young age. Estimated age of looking at it is just 100 million years, right? So this is truly a baby star. And furthermore, because it's a baby star, as it's formed, it, it's rapidly rotating, and the disk of matter around it, in which planets are forming, are formed from that disk. Our sun, once upon a time, would have looked like Altair. It wouldn't have been a nice round star. It would be like a, an oblate spheroid, because it's spinning so fast. It would fly. look like a football. Yeah, yes. but gradually, yeah, a rugby football. <laughs> a rugby football, yes. But gradually, over time, um, its interaction, magnetic interaction with the disk, the disk expands, the star slows down. So once upon a time, our star would have been a rapidly spinning star. Yes. And for those of you looking at it, this is not, of course, actually a photograph. It's actually an artist's impression of the, one of the surfaces of one of the planets uh, that is forming around um, this star right now. And of course, at 100 million years, the, if you go back into our solar system it's a hundred million years old well the earth would have been molten right as, as would have the moon right? so again we're looking at what the earth would have looked like 
exactly during yeah. its formation long before yeah. the formation of life and so on that's right, right yes yeah so that it's that's uh, all volcanoes and red hot rock yeah yeah yes that's right yeah and then of course this star is just on our doorstep and of course with things like the hubble space tell now the james webb telescope we're being being getting to be able to look into much greater detail there was much increased um collision from asteroids and comets and things in too oh yes because yeah. the whole thing was quite disturbed the whole yeah. of the system yeah. Well, well, indeed. Even if even the, planets if hit the each Earth other. If it was cool enough, then it wouldn't. It would. The surface would be molten just by the number of collisions taking yeah. place. You know. <laughs> but you know, in our early um, solar system, there were planets that hit each other. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Maybe we should look at that. The origin of our solar system, how it was born. Yeah, and later it's fascinating. It is. Yeah, it certainly it's is. It's a changing picture too, as people learn. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay, right, to finish up with folks, I um, should tell you that um, about Stonehenge, we're open at the moment from Wednesday through to Sunday from 10am to 4pm. So that means we're closed on Mondays and Tuesdays, except for private bookings. And we run uh, guided tours. Um, you can just come in and go around the henge and watch an audio visual and that sort of thing that shows you how it all works and then take yourself on a journey around with a map. But you can also have uh, guided tours, but these need to be booked and so on, okay? And there's a, for those of watching, there's a photograph of me doing a guided tour there with a group of people doing all the storytelling and so on, right? A bit disappointing, isn't it? It's not Andromeda's. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. And the, th the thing is, the reason why we built Stonehenge, it's a bit like, to me, it's a part of the great unknown, you know? We, a lot of our history is unknown. And stone circles were all built long before the time of the written world. But encoded in those, they're like great big stone computers, is all the information our ancestors needed for survival. And things that we're looking at, like the zodiac and that sort of thing, and these all date back long, long before, um, before the uh, written word. Right. Well, this is when we had a, de had a dependence on a knowledge of when um, the different seasons were coming. Yeah. Um, we had to be able to prepare for the winter seasons and the summer seasons and so forth. Mm. And that's part, it's just part of what the original um, English Stonehenge was about. Yeah. It's knowing when um, when to do uh, when to do things. It was so important that you'll find something very similar. Virtually, yeah. no matter which culture you come from, you will find something that yeah. was used in a very very similar way. Well, as I say to people, we 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 find it difficult to imagine sometimes what it would be like without all that information. And I ask them, say, well, you know, if you've never seen a calendar, right, would you know what month we're in? Yes. And I mean, I can remember uh, a couple of months ago, we had one day when well, it was like the middle of summer, and the next day we had snow up on the mountains, and that's how it changed so rapidly. And But you see, for our ancestors, this was a matter of life and death, because if you sailed at the wrong time, you never came back. If yes. you planted your seeds at the wrong time, your crop could fail. And there was no one to bail you out in those days. So this sort of information was absolutely vital, and it's tied in with the the stars and so on that people will observe. Yeah, our hinge is not a copy of anybody else's hinge, although it is similar in dimension to the the one you think of in Stonehenge and Salisbury Plain. It's really showing you what you could do with such a thing if it was properly surveyed. In mm. other words, if it was exceedingly accurate, what could you do with it? Mm. Mm. And that's what it's about. So it is showing you a window into what your ancestors did, um, but we know what ours can do um they were learning in terms of sound and things like that but um they'll still be arguing about those ancient ones mm. you yeah. know my grandkids will be listening if we survive we'll be listening to arguments about that yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's right so in other words i say you can you can uh, just do a sort of what we call a trek around the stones during the daytime and also you can do guided tours but they have to be booked and it's best for the group of people all right but you can come yeah. in and the other thing is we do star treks so if you want to find your way around the heavens right now and pick out those stars look at all the things i've been showing you tonight we do star treks but again they need to be booked okay and keith 
would you like to play a bit of music as we lead out? Yeah. So that's it now, for folks, and I'll say goodnight, and we'll be catching up with you soon. Thank you.